All right, everybody. Filipino martial arts, the 22nd of April. Chinese, Filipino, Thai, Indonesian, French and Dog Brothers, Japanese. Let's get a single stick. And live stick, soft stick, doesn't matter. As long as you have something. Um, again, I gave a longer historical explanation, historical background of Dog Brothers, I think last class or the class before. Um, there are two pathways. Remember, there's the fighter's pathway, doing what they call real contact stick fighting, fighting with live sticks and a minimum of protective equipment to test the art in the most realistic way possible. It's not a competition. We don't keep a fight record. It's a laboratory environment. Some fights you're the, the hammer and some fights you're the anvil, okay? Then there is also Dog Brothers Martial Arts. There is a curriculum. There is, um, you know, levels of instructorship. Um, and uh, I'm not making a joke. A few years ago, they came up with the dog tag rankings instead of belts because it's Dog Brothers. There's different colored dog tags, okay? So um, as a first or second level instructor, especially online, I am not allowed to show you all of the current Dog Brothers curriculum. If we were training in person at one of my, at my in an academy space, I can teach as much of the system as I want to teach. But, you know, the, the protocol, since Punan Guru Mark Denny makes his living um, teaching this material, you know, as, as a first level instructor, I'm only allowed to show you so much. But that's okay, because we're going to start with some of the seminal stuff, and then I'm going to show you some things that are really important to my fight game, single stick and double stick. So we were working on our power strikes. There's only four power strikes. Instead of 12 angles, there's four shots that we want to own and we want to be able to hit as hard as possible with as little effort as possible. So we isolate all four of these angles, right? Angle one and angle three are forehands. So we start with our weight in front and we drop it back. We reset the stick every time we do that. We could also reset with an arco or a florete or a tail. Those are synonyms for the same thing. Dosi Paris, they say arco. Inosanto Lacosta, you might hear florete. Dog Brothers is like the dog's tail. Okay? So a backhand tail takes us back to the forehand side. Dog Brothers Power Shot 2, our weight starts in the back, so we're very light on our lead foot. We start with it on our left shoulder. We're still in a right lead facing front. Our left hand is inside, and we're hitting the other side of the hourglass. I can reset just by moving it back, or I can arco, florete, do a tail on the other side. Okay, so what I would say in even the numbering system that I taught you, one and two are the two sides of the X. Dog Brothers, it's more on the border between diagonal and vertical. And I mean, if you're a mathematician, you're probably getting mad because I guess technically that's diagonal, but it's so close to vertical. Um, so what they tend to say is one, it's what one side of the hourglass, angle one and angle two, right? Or power shot one and power shot two. Power shot three has all the same attributes as power shot one. Weight starts in the front, we're on our right shoulder, but it's gonna be this high forehand horizontal. I wanna hit the person in their left temple and knock them unconscious. 
That's the idea, all right? Just like at certain, when you work boxing with certain people, your coach might have you, when you're working on the hook, get up on your toes, right? As you're learning how, I know you can't see, I'll do it like a low body hook. As I'm learning how to, you know, generate power via body mechanics with my hook, lots of boxing coaches will have you get up on that toe. You're dropping your body weight back. In this case, you're bringing it right back to the front. But that's what we're doing with one and three. Our weight is in the front. We drop it back. You can florete back. The forehands, you can power assist with your live hand by pulling. So you literally would take your live hand, put it on the other forearm, and pull it through the power arc to make that shot harder, okay? All of these are tools. Do you have to do these things? No. What you really have to do is experience all of them to figure out what fits you the best. So it's like I like to say, I'll say in JKD a lot, it's a forced exploration, all right? You have to explore these things to figure out what fits you best. Put it on your left shoulder, put your weight in the back, drop your weight to the front and hit that high uh, power backhand horizontal to what would be your opponent's right temple if the stick is in your right hand, okay? The boxing parallel that I would give you is the cross, right? If my, if my weight is here, I drop my weight to the front, boom, to generate the cross, the power on the cross. That's the same with, the, with power shots two and four. My weight is back, I drop my weight to the front to generate as much power as possible. Okay, so put it back on your right shoulder, weight in the, start with your weight in the front, drop it back for one, drop it forward for two, back for three, and forward for four. One more set, one, two, three, four, okay? Now, whichever side you were working, it looks like everybody was working their right hand, put the stick in the other hand, change leads. This, and now we're working our complementary side. It might be a little awkward, but so what? We wanna be well-rounded, we want bilateralism. Your complementary side doesn't have the natural gifts that your dominant side does. So it's worth it to invest some time. Weight is forward. Drop it back for one, forward for two, back for three, forward for four. Take uh, two more sets on your own, your own pace. Okay, so it's, I'm not gonna devote an incredible amount of time, but it is, it's worth the expenditure of energy to work this on your, on your complementary side, complementary lead. Um, what I'm about to say is really important. And as an instructor, I'm aware something I struggle with sometimes is balancing my instructor chatter with physical training. I'm aware of that because that's the educator in me. Like I can't help myself. Here's the information and the knowledge, like take it. What I'm about to say though is gonna be all intellectual. It's very important and I want you to hear it. it. It made a big impact on me early in my development. In Dog Brothers, we don't say strong side, weak side. We don't say good side, bad side. All right, what, I mean, we, a lot of us subscribe to things like neuro-linguistic programming you cannot necessarily control what happens to you in this life, but you can control the language that you use, which directly influences your perception. 
So if you have 10 years running around calling your left hand your bad hand, over time, I'm sorry, even subconsciously, that has an effect on you. So we say dominant versus complementary. It's not bad. It's your complementary side. It might require a little bit more attention and energy because once again, it doesn't have the natural gifts of your dominant side. Um, so I don't want to lose anybody and I'll get off my soapbox in about 30 seconds. I know sometimes in, in this day and age in our society, there's a lot of talk about like walking on eggshells with your language. As martial artists, I would just say we are, it, we're supposed to be above the norm. So we should be able to purposefully craft the language that we use to become the best versions of ourselves. So just take that concept and like look at your practice as a martial artist. I mean, how much, how much negative talk or maybe even negative head chatter with yourself do you engage in? And um, at least like give it a name and try to refine that. All right, I'm done. Um, so you have your power shots. One, two, three, four. Um, we've, we started, we, we real briefly, we started um, with, uh, we started working on tools to develop a snaky stick, um, I think a few weeks ago. So again, a snaky stick fighter is the kind of fighter who can keep his or her stick in perpetual motion. And the reason we call it a snaky stick is it reminded the early dog brothers of like the head of a snake that's already in motion. Well, it's harder to see when it leaps out and tries to bite its prey, right? Well, here it's the same thing. If my stick is in motion, that is a much harder fighter type to deal with. And let's just invest maybe two minutes in talking about the fighter types in Dog Brothers. This is the very first fighter type. This is the caveman. The caveman, not to be sexist, could be a cave woman too, but we don't ever really want to be this fighter type. This is the person that menaces you with this forehand chamber, and then when you get in range, uh, they're going to try to hit you. So... It's really your job when you encounter a cave, cave person to look scared, control the range, block in some way, because you know where they're going to be hitting you, and um, try to deal with it. So that's the caveman. Um, early Dog Brothers, unfortunately, even people with lots of training, when they got in the adrenal state, their training vanished. Ah. Uh, and they just started reverting to the caveman. So let's, unless we're mixing that, like we have a whole bunch of other games that we play, and then maybe in the course of like a, a three minute round, I play my caveman game for 20, 25 seconds to mess around with the person's head. With the exception of something like that, let's, let's try never to be cavemen or cave women. We're, we have, we're way more refinement than that, okay? Um, the happy dog. This is the happy dog fighter. The happy dog fighter keeps his or her stick on center line, and they kind of shake it here. And this reminded the dog brothers of the dog's tail, kind of wagging from side to side. And so, you know, there are pros and cons of the happy dog. Pros, well, the happy dog has his or her center line really well defined. And if you're my opponent, I can stalk you with this stick in place and have a very clear obstruction, okay? What are some of the weaknesses? Well, if I'm on center line, if I go to hit you with a forehand, it's highly telegraphic. If I go to hit you with a backhand, it's highly telegraphic. So there's strengths and weaknesses. And I started off uh, in Dog Brothers before I had actual Dog Brothers training as a happy dog fighter. And I, I mean, no 
no serious injuries. So it's not necessarily a bad structure. Um, it's got some things going for it. It's just maybe not as refined as our snaky stick, okay? The backhander, the backhander stays here. And um, I know like we've worked on the backhand series before, but um, like Tuhan Phillip, uh, sled dog out of Montreal, he really started off as a backhander. And I mean, because he's awesome in every single way anyways, I mean, he did just fine um, starting off with that structure until he developed a more refined game, okay? Obviously, you know, strengths of this structure, if you can avoid getting hit, like you just can't avoid it, well, the outside of your arms, not your elbows, but the outside of your arms, that's like the best place to get hit with a stick. I'm talking... If the only other option is like eating the shot to the head, if you cannot avoid getting hit with a live blunt impact weapon, the, like the best place on your body is like your tricep area, the outside of your arm, not your elbows, okay? So this natural structure provides a lot of um, like protection. What, what are some of the weaknesses? Well, unless you're doing stuff like that, most of your strikes are gonna come out of that backhand side, right? So it's a little predictable. So in Dog Brothers, we would never say that the ultimate greatest fighter type is a snaky stick fighter, because we don't use language like that. We've seen over the years, we've seen people be successful with almost anything. It's the individual, not the style, okay? It's very important. Um, but that being said, a snaky stick fighter is a really hard fighter type to deal with. So let's work on some tools where we start developing our snaky stick. So I think we looked at the clock. If we haven't, or you haven't seen it, or you don't remember it, just start doing it with me. This, from your perspective, this is a counterclockwise circle. Okay? And... The nice part about the clock is there's this imaginary barrier that I'm defining where it's like you've got, to, if you're my opponent, you've got to get past this to get to me. That's kind of the nice part about the clock. Now, on a very basic level, and you can play with this, you know, all week until next week's class, hit an angle or two, go back to your clock. If you have pet segitas or patterns, play with those and go back to your clock. Power shot, you know, power shot to florete, back to your clock. Singular shots, back to your clock. Some of your favorite combinations, back to your clock, all right? And I can only move around a limited amount of my living room training space here, but you can see, I mean, what I can do with the clock as far as defining this area. This is like my imaginary shield. Come and get me, person, <laughs> right? But you gotta get past this. And the stick's always moving. And my shots are coming out of motion. Okay, and again, it's just a very important point. Not the best fighter type, but a hard fighter type to deal with. Okay, um, so you have the clock. We've been playing with floretes or arcos or tails. Once again, I'm not showing off. Um, I like to teach the different terminology because if you can memorize it, Awesome. Um, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody. You know, Guru Inosanto is my primary martial arts influence. What I get from him, try to seek out as many quality people as possible and experience what they have to offer. That right there, that's like the mission statement for my martial arts practice for my whole life. Okay, so what I'm about to say is I'm stating some facts about my background. These are not statements of ego. 
I have instructorships in five different system of, systems of Filipino martial arts. I'm pursuing two more here in New York City. I'm not a certificate chaser. I'm not a title chaser. <laughs> what was always taught to me again, see how different people approach martial arts problems and experience what they have to offer. So if you're in Dosi Paris, this is an ARCO. If you're in Inosanto La Costa, this is a florete. If you're in Dog Brothers, where Punanguru Mark gives everything, you know, kind of silly names, not to be disrespectful, to help you memorize it, this is a tail. This is like the dog's tail. Okay, so you have your clock. You can strike out of the clock to an arco back to the clock. Any power shot, excuse me, any power shot to an arco to a clock. Any combination to an arco to a, hey buddy, to a clock. Okay, I'm trying to give you templates to take what you already know, okay? Do, can you only do the material that I've been teaching you with, the, with these training devices? Absolutely not. If you know other one, two, three, four, five, six, right, whatever it may be, if you know other numbering systems, string some of those together and then go to your clock or string some of those together and then arco and then go back to your clock. The purpose of my class isn't to make you change styles. It isn't to make you to make you renounce any of your prior training. That's not what I do. I'm giving you tools to interface with what you might already know to start to develop your own style. Because I can't make you, this is not a statement of ego. I can't make you me as a stick fighter, okay? I'm a pretty good stick fighter. All I can do is help you find yourself. I know that sounds like cheesy <laughs> life coach talk, but as a fighter, that's not my role um, with you as a fighter and me as a coach. My job is not to try to turn you into another version of me. My job is to try to help you figure out what fits you and where your style lies, okay? So you have your power shots. What I would say is if you know other angles from other systems, try to do those angles with the body weight manipulation of the Dog Brothers power shots to generate as much um, power as possible. Excuse me. And what you're really looking for, you're trying to lock down probably no more than five or six angles that are super natural for you and you can always hit hard with them with very little effort. And those seems to seem to be the things that keep coming out, all right? Now, I don't know what everybody's particular situation is. If you have, in whatever environment you're stuck in right now, where we're all stuck at home, if you have anything you can hit, a heavy bag, a bob dummy, um, let me finish this statement before you react. You have a backyard and you have a tree that you could just lightly, you don't want to bang up and ruin and destroy your tree, but you could touch it lightly like that. If you have something like that even, um, what's really good for this kind of work is three minute rounds. Like doo -doo -doo, timer goes off and you work your snaky stick. And if it's a heavy bag, that's just the best thing in the world as long as it's a heavy bag you can hit without getting into trouble and what tends to happen the first maybe 90 seconds or maybe even two minutes things feel pretty good and pretty natural it's that last minute 
where your body's going to start to, unless you have a lot of experience, you're going to start to feel really, I'm going to make a word up here, uncreative. <laughs> okay. But those things, those combos that keep coming out, that those are the things that your body is naturally inclined to do. And you want to start isolating some of those things and figuring out like, and again, I'm talking more, you know, sparring, stick fighting, whatever the relative level of padding. I'm talking more now as a fighter than as a technician. Okay, so um, let's, let's add a few more things and then we still have some time here. So here, this term is being used in a completely different way, okay? This is Pachiti Tercia Sagita number one. And for most of my FMA experience, when you say Sagita, I'm thinking about an attack pattern. Here, they're using it more like, um, like a motion generator or a template of movement out of which your attacks you know, could be generated. Okay, and it, it really is that simple and a lot of you are doing it beautifully. The tip, is gonna really stay facing your opponent. If your hand is high, the stick is low. And if your stick is high, your hand is, you know, they switch places, right? High, low, high. So I'll talk about only my hand. Low, high, low, high, and the stick is high, low, high, low, all right? And for me, my current kind of default mode when I tap in and start moving around, I like the circular motion of the clock, but I kind of balance moving my rear hand like Pekiti Tercia Sagita number one. I very rarely go straight up and down. I like the circular and I kind of move my live hand when I'm fighting single stick in coordination with that. Okay, so. Uh, the clock, Pekiti Tercia Sagita number one, both arcos or florettes or tails, okay? So you have in that the basic building blocks as they were created out of the Dog Brothers curriculum to start developing your snaky stick. Um, can I, can I borrow you from, this is, I, okay. This is very important, everybody. And this will only take a second, but this is so important for you to understand. Dog Brothers theory of seven ranges. And, um, Rodney, this almost goes back to our conversation, I believe at the end of last week, when we were talking about the origin of the name of the system, Lameco. Okay. Now, not to be disrespectful to anybody and not to say the dog brothers are not saying they know more dog brothers are trying to deepen your understanding okay most systems of filipino martial arts only factor in three ranges and they're stick or weapon focused ranges right so hold your stick like right there that's perfect okay largo the range at which we could hit each other's hands. Medio, medium range or hand check range. And then corto, and I promise I'm not gonna hit you. Corto really is by itself a striking range. I, I'm in range to hit with my puño or my knee or my elbow, okay? That's how, and frankly, that's Inesanto Lacosta. And Inesanto Lacosta, is my mother system and will be for the rest of my life. But it's a three range system. Dog Brothers theory of seven ranges. This is super cool for all of you to understand. Okay, um, just take a fighting stance and hold it. Good, don't move. Okay, so I'm in the shot. Good, now keep in mind everybody, we're, we're stuck in our living room here in our <laughs> 800 square foot apartment. I don't have much more room, okay? Um, this range, we, if, unless we really move in, there is no contact. 
And if I could go further out without exiting the frame, I would do that. This is the, this is the longest range, pre-contact. This is snake range. So this is where I use my snaky stick and I evaluate the structure. And you know, she keeps her left hand a little bit low, good. And okay, don't get too crazy. Um, and I'm trying to make my determination about how am I, how do I think I want to attack? Where are the holes in this person's structure? And so on. So snake range, pre-contact. Okay, hold your weapon out like this. All right. And once again, everybody, bear with me because we have minimal space. Weapon contact only. Don't move. I cannot hit her hand. She cannot hit my hand at that range. Weapon contact only. Bubble range. Bubble. Because the imaginary bubble of safety that came with distance has just been popped. So snake, bubble, then largo, medio, corto, as I just explained them, then maybe she grabs my wrist, and then I'm trying to double leg and take down. Standing grappling, with or without a weapon, and then if we end up grappling on the ground, ground grappling, with or without a weapon. Snake, bubble, largo, medio, corto, standing grappling, ground grappling. Dog Brothers theory of seven ranges, okay? So thank you. So once again, not to be disrespectful to anybody, if the majority of systems are only computing largo, medio, corto, and those are all ranges in relationship to stick, the Dog Brothers theory of seven ranges is really quite cool in terms of what happens pre-contact, weapon contact only, inside of corto, whether that's stand-up grappling or ground grappling, okay? Because again, the nice part about real contact stick fighting, you have tons of validation about how much abuse the human body can actually take, right? It's not to be disrespectful to anybody. For a long time, it was like, well, the second you get touched with that live stick, like it's over, right? And I mean, I'm, I'm not being macho. Like I can tell you from 50 Dog Brothers fights, that is really not the case. I mean, can a properly placed shot incapacitate somebody? Absolutely. Um, is the human body capable of taking a lot more damage than we usually think? Yes, it is. Okay, so... Snake, bubble, largo, medio, corto, standing, grappling, ground grappling. Dog Brothers theory of seven ranges. And we want to be proficient and deadly and have a strategy at all seven of those ranges. All right. Anyways, let's, um, let's get back to our single stick. Let's start going over what we were working on last week and let's add the final combos. So we were looking at our single stick Lameco combos. So if I jab forehand and I step back and cut that forehand redondo, that's the way that the late Punanguru Edgar taught it in his old, his original VHS tape. Versus as I jab, if I cut this Illustrissimo cross step at the same time, and then hit that redondo with no footwork. That's a little bit more uh, the way he was doing it in some private lesson footage that was filmed a few months before he passed away. So I make my students learn both. So let's just review the, the upper body skills. We did 3A and 3B, 3A and 3B, 5A and 5B. So 3A, no footwork, forehand jab, Forehand redondo, right? From the side, forehand jab, forehand redondo. So I'm hitting, if I'm in my right hand, hitting three o'clock, hitting 12 o'clock with as little preparatory motion as possible. 3B is the same thing on the backhand side. No footwork right now. Backhand jab, backhand redondo. 
or Bronda, right? Hitting nine o'clock, hitting 12 o'clock with no, again, no, boom, preparatory motion. If this is your hand and I just hit the side of it, ah, now I'm trying to hit the top of it with little to no preparatory motion, okay? So that's three, three A. The A version is always going to be forehand. The B version is always going to be backhand. But it's always going to be the same combo. Jab to redondo. Jab to redondo. Five, no footwork yet. Five A, jab to redondo to a single follow-up shot. Five B, jab to redondo to a single follow-up shot. And then just remember on your backhand side, just let that stick circle around again, okay? So 5A, jab, redondo, follow-up. 5B, jab, redondo, follow-up. So now, what was I saying about footwork and what was I trying to kind of explain last time? In, and actually, because we had some online dialogue, yeah, I got it hit here. I've still got it. This, this is the VHS tape that I'm talking about. This is Poonan Guru Edgar's first single stick tape from Unique Publications. This is the first FMA instructional material I ever saw because I bought that when I was like 18, maybe 19 years old, okay? It, and I've worn that tape down to a nub, so you have to trust me. In that tape, jab with no footwork, Redondo with a Ritirata Illustrissimo, and then we're always coming in on our follow-up, no matter which footwork timing we're doing, okay? So we'll review everything that we've done together with that footwork timing. So 3A, forehand jab, step straight back and cut that Redondo. That's it. Come back to a uh, right lead. On your backhand side, jab with no footwork, backhand side, cut that brondo with a ritirata illustrissimo. Beautiful, okay? For five, Lameco five, we're just adding in the follow-up. So forehand jab, forehand redondo with the step back, step in when you put them away with the follow-up shot. Five B, Backhand jab, no footwork. Ritirata illustrissimo. Step back in to a right lead when you follow up. Okay? And that's, that's the way it's demoed on that VHS tape that I just showed you. In the private lesson footage, now I'm going to go to my, my feet here. And again, I'm sorry, everybody. I wish I had a different camera. Uh, hopefully in the not too distant future the shot will be wide enough where you can see my whole body at the same time, okay? So I shared with you last time, because of my background, I struggle with a good Ritti Rada Illustrissimo because this rear foot, I always want to rotate it a little bit, like, all right? And my, like, I've trained with uh, Guru Dino Flores out of Eagle Rock, California, and other Lameco people. This foot is supposed to be stuck, like it doesn't move at all, and you step straight back. That's a good Ritirata Illustrissimo, okay? But 3A, with the timing on the tape, jab, redondo, with the Ritirata Illustrissimo. If it's 5A, jab, redondo, follow-up. Versus, um, we, sorry, we have some, some packages showing up for my son's birthday here. We, uh, on, on this, VA, uh, uh, this videotape of a private lesson, a couple of months before he passed, the, the timing is different, okay? On the jab, he's doing this deep illustrissimo cross step. No footwork on the redondo and then coming back in, um, like always, when you put the person away on the follow-up beat. And um, Punanguru Mark didn't really have an answer. He could, you know, did it change? 
what as as improbable as it is was you know was was Kunanguru Edgar making a mistake was he doing it differently for that fighter and because you know he passed away in the late 90s we can't ask him because i use this material to hit people all the time and i know it's so good i force my students to learn both versions so everybody getting your right lead when you hey buddy we're almost done okay when um when you do the timing that I just explained to you, jab, everybody jab with no footwork, and then step back on that redondo. If you fit and freeze for a second, if you finish right there, it's 3A. If you step in for the follow-up, then it's 5A, right? And go ahead. And it would be the same thing on the backhand side, right? So everybody put the stick in your backhand side and get in a right lead. You know, if I no footwork on this jab, Ritirata Illustrissimo on the redondo, if I stop here, it's 3B, and then beautiful, as some of you are doing, if you step in with the backhand follow up, then it's 5B. Okay? Um, that timing, the timing that is shown in this, I call Lameco timing versus I just call the other one Dog Brothers timing because that's the context that I saw it in. Illustrissimo cross step on that jab, redondo. If you terminate there, it's 3A. If I step back in to put them away, it's 5A. On the backhand side, here's my, I'm doing Illustrissimo cross step. As I jab, no footwork on my redondo. And then if I do the follow-up, it's 5B. If I terminate the Sagita right here, then it's 3B. Okay? And that's, I teach Lameco timing and Dog Brothers timing. And there's only two more combinations on both sides. So let's, let's learn them. This way, everybody can start, you can start practicing them. And then you'll have them down next week, and then I can start building even more stuff on this. So Lameco 7A. Let's we're gonna do Lameco timing, okay? So no footwork on the jab. Jab, step back, redondo, redondo again, and then step in. That's it. So that's 7A with Lameco timing. 7B with Lameco timing. Jab, no footwork. Step back on the first redondo, hit a second redondo, hit your follow up, and that's it. Okay. Um, if we do 7A with Dog Brothers timing, Illustrissimo cross step on this jab, double redondo with no footwork, step in and put the person away. Okay. 7B with uh, Dog Brothers timing, some of you already know it, and that's excellent. Jab with your Illustrissimo cross step. Double redondo, stationary, and here's your follow-up. Okay, so it's, before I give you uh, Lameco 9, it's a very manageable system of combinations because there's really only four of them. We've learned three so far. Lameco 3, jab to redondo. Lameco 5, jab to redondo to a follow-up. Lameco seven, jab to double redondo to a single follow-up. And notice I wasn't calling forehand or backhand because if you memorize it, Lameco three, jab to redondo. You know that's the same on both sides. 3A, Lameco timing, right? 3B, Lameco timing. 3A, Dog Brothers timing. 3B, Dog Brothers timing. All I have to memorize is one combo, jab to redondo. For five, all I have to memorize is one combo, jab to redondo to follow up. Jab to redondo to follow up. That was 5A with Lameco timing. Jab with my Illustrissimo cross step to redondo to my follow up. That was 5B with Dog Brothers timing. 
but it's only one combo. 7A, jab to double redondo to single follow-up. B, jab to double redondo to single follow-up. So it's very simple. And um, I'm, I'm not trying to make things more complicated with this footwork thing. Um, I have fighting examples where both have been relevant. So I want you to experience both of them. Again, it's a forced exploration, as I call it. I want you to experience it so that you can filter it for your own usage. Okay, and then let's learn the Mako 9, and you then, with the exception of the numbering system, you then learned all the Lameco that I teach in my entire FMA core curriculum. No footwork, and I'm just gonna call it with no sides. Lameco 9 is jab to single redondo to double follow-up. So it's very simple, all right? Uh, 9A, Dog Brothers timing. Jab to single redondo to double follow-up, okay? And like all the other ones, you're going to step back into that right lead um, on the first follow-up or the third motion, right? So if I'm doing 9B with Lameco timing, jab, no footwork, single redondo, double follow-up. All right? So, um, it, you know, I'll, I'll bottle this quickly for you without going over everything again, if you need to watch the, you know, the class is being recorded. So you can, you can visit my, my, sorry to sound salesy, can visit my YouTube page and watch it. Um, but it is there for you. Okay. Lameco three, jab to Redondo. Lameco five, jab to Redondo to one follow-up. Lameco seven, jab to double Redondo to a single follow-up. Lameco nine, jab to a single redondo to a double follow-up. And then the only thing you have to do, this is a really easy way to differentiate it for yourself. Either the footwork starts on the second beat, and if you're doing it that way, it's what I call Lameco timing, or the footwork starts with an illustrissimo cross step on the first beat. And that's what I'm calling Dog Brothers timing. And I want you to explore both of those because um, the Lameco timing, sometimes, sometimes you, like we're calling this a jab, just like in boxing, the jab does so much. It sets up so much. It sets up it explores, it reveals holes in the other person's game. It can, it can create opportunities. It can put the person in a disadvantageous position for them, advantageous for you. And when you do it with Lameco timing, there's so many reasons why you might just want to be right there on the, on, on like in it, um, but without moving your feet. And then there are times during the fight, a lot of times it's almost got like a G-Tech kind of energy where, boom, you're moving out of range and intercepting on either side with that jab and then coming back to, um, to the remainder of the, the combination. Okay, and... Um, what I would share with you, what I'm always on the lookout for, this is not be, me being judgmental. Um, this is, you know, I started, do, I started fighting Dog Brothers in 2006. It's, it's, I've been at this a while. Certainly more, I mean, it's a lot, you know, some of the guys have way more experience, way more fights, and I'm, I'm very, you know, <laughs> very realistic about that. Um, I think I've earned the right to my opinion, though. Here's what I'm usually on the lookout for. 
the, the fight starts, okay, and they move around a little bit, and, and I call it dueling exes. You see that, like, forehand and backhand lob ticks, du just dueling exes, man, like, and, and that's something, and that will work to some, maybe on somebody who's not initiated or somebody who has no training, but you know, all you gotta do is hold that line and I mean, intercept those lines on some different angles. So I, I see that so often, dueling X's. And this system, even if you just explored those Sagitas on both sides. Let's say you were like, well, I don't want to learn the Dog Brothers timing. Even if you just learned those four Sagitas on both sides with Lameco timing and you did them thousands of times, you would still have a way more refined stick fighting system than dueling X's. Okay? Um, and the only other thing that I'll share, dueling X's often leads to people standing there trading shots. And that's a certain door. And if you really want to walk through that door to know how much you can take, I mean, I guess that's cool. I would rather turn you into a stick fighter who controls the range and you know how to enter and exit and you're only getting hit because the person that you're fighting is really, really good. And it's those moments where you were supposed to get hit because you were supposed to learn something as opposed to we both stand there and we, you know, we hit each, we pepper each other with, with shots. And then at the end of it, we kind of go, yeah, we're, pardon me, we're badasses because we stood there and hit each other 30 times. Like, okay, um, I can see some value to that. I can see more value trying to turn you into a refined, you know, um, deadly, uh, not literally deadly, but, you know, um, a refined, really advanced uh, stick fighter who really, you know, chooses purposefully his or her moments to enter and engage. And um, you keep the amount of times that you get hit to a minimum because you just understand range and distance and um, again, unless it's just somebody who's really, really good and you were supposed to get hit to learn a lesson that you're not just standing there beating each other up because you think that's cool. I mean, that is kind of cool, I guess, but it's cooler to be the person who you just, you're always on the edge and your opponent's just like, God, they're always like, oh, they're always a half an inch out of range that's that's a little bit cooler okay so anyways um we are over time are there any questions i have a question go ahead sir um i was they have a lot of videos of i don't know what would would you call him a like grandmaster or grand tuhan or gm edgar sulete they have all these different um I guess titles for him and it's not so much that it's just the fact that he's on line like describing these different strikes and so like I think because maybe he had some kind of um, cultural desire to preserve the these terms and so he will like I, I posted something on your Facebook and, and I don't know if this is something for next time and I don't know how it mixes with the Lameco versus Dog Brothers footwork, but he called it Caballero footwork. Uh -huh. And then I think the way you described it is strikes three and four. And I tried to use the system the way you taught it, 
but the way when he described it, it was more of like just like a plansada and and he he was i don't know if that's better to have a metaphor of like a, a spanish culture iron being like a plancha going back and forth or or if it's better to segment the the horizontal strikes into like like the numbers three and four with the caballero footwork which i think is spanish for gentlemen so like taking these things out is it better to preserve his memory using the words that he said or to like kind of break it down in a way that makes it better for people to understand so yeah i i'll speak for myself okay because i unfortunately I know this is like trying, you know, it's going to sound like I'm worming my way out of giving you an answer. Um, it, it has to look different based on each practitioner. Like if you're with Guru Dino, Eagle Rock, California, or Guru David Gould, he's in Missouri now after being in California for a long time. They were students of uh, Punang Guru Edgar's. They, they teach what he taught and they preserve the terminology and that is their methodology for Filipino martial arts because that's what they do. They do Lameco. Guru Dino also does a little bit of Illustrissimo, but he never mixes that you you know you're doing Lameco and you know you're doing Illustrissimo and he very purposefully differentiates those um I because because of my approach like I'm trying to present you things in an academic context so I would uh, try to retain as much of the original language and pick a context that's appropriate as possible. But for example, in today's lesson, I was talking from a stick fighting perspective. So I was sort of giving you more Dog Brothers terminology than straightforward Lameco. So it, it's sort of, Rodney, like, what's your focus and what are you trying to do in the moment? And um, based on that, choosing... So choosing as a learner, we can, we, can, we can do what you did last week. You said you do both. You'll, you'll have the largo, medio, corto, but you'll say like la large, uh, long, medium, short, and right. then you have the, the seven ranges. So right. it's okay to say like strike one, two, three, four, or X strike planza or planchada, mm -hmm. like to mix it all both is like an act rather than just kind of erase the entire, like his own words, right? Yes, I, I think so. And then, I mean, that's a little bit more Guru in Asanto. Like here's this and it comes from this system and they're going to use this terminology. But if you're exploring that in this system, they might say this and these aspects might be more important to this group of the same movements. You know what I mean, I'm saying? The groups like countries since the whole 300 years of Spanish colonialization. I know that the Cali schools try to say there's something before, but then, you know, I was in Spain over the summer. And so I think because America has so many Spanish speaking, it would be good for Filipino right. martial arts for people to say, hey, this is also Spanish culture too from King Philip of Spain. This strike three and four is our culture and you could attract, you know, the people who would be recuperating their culture rather than, you know, other cultures, they just know what continent they're from. Right. I mean, and then, you know, uh, I mean, without going, we, get, we do have to wrap things up and I'm sorry, but like you bring up for me, you might also have things like San Miguel, where certain Seguidas have a non-secular application. And then there's almost a relationship between the fighting arts and some kind of spirituality or, or um, religion. I'll use the R word. Um, and then, of course, you know, people in our culture... I mean, you know, I'm an ex-public school teacher, so it kind of raises the, oh, you're talking about non-secular things, and that's kind of not my background. But I, 
I just find all that stuff fascinating and it should be preserved, but it's such, it's so hard because how many different, we've talked about the historian's perspective. We've, we've talked about the uh, sociologist's perspective. Um, I was just talking about the theologian's perspective. And then are you just a hobbyist and you're, it's, it's like martial scholarship? Are you a fighter? Are you just looking? I want to pick up three or four things that are combative and that's all I want to learn. It's really dependent on what you want to take away. It's, it's such a lifelong multifaceted thing. Thank you, Dr. Brian. That's You're welcome, sir. Answer. All right. That's, that's again, I'm not trying to duck your, it's a great question. Um, but to properly answer it, I probably need like another three hours and I don't have it, but I hope I, provided something so definitely all right well let's let's just bow out everybody i know we're late and then i'll end the uh the recording here so chinese filipino thai indonesian french and dog brothers japanese all right thanks very much everybody thanks for a great class see you all next